What's going on, guys? This is Dan Wynn, and welcome to the Military Cash Flow. Today, we got a great guest. We got Ty Mangum on, and she's going to tell us about her life and her journey um, as a military investor. So, Ty, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate that. Uh, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and who you are and what you do? Sure. Well, thanks for ha having me. I'm excited about that. Um, Ty Mangum, Ty Anika, Ty Mangum. Um, hail originally from Charlotte, North Carolina, um, but in Call Virginia, my home, but I currently live outside of Nashville, Tennessee. Um, really, real estate. I've been a homeowner since when I didn't know what that meant uh, in the, my 20s, uh, and then went on to um, just kind of be a part of that. Um, I'm in the um, active guard military, so active guard reserve for the military, for the army. Um, I've been doing that for minutes, uh, over 17 years, been in the reserve a uh, bit. Uh, so um, kind of not quite winding now. You ask folks, it's kind of I'm kind of winding up. Um, but yes, I started uh, real estate investing in 2017, um, and then did uh, open my company Renaissance Properties of the Carolinas in 2018, and then saw what someone made off of me from a commission sale, and thought, well, maybe I could keep that money. Um, and then became a licensed real estate agent in 2018 in North Carolina. So yeah, got four, excuse me, five doors um, in, that, in that amount of time. Um, focuses on single family right now. Um, yes, so looking to help folks who want to obviously buy a home, sell a home, but more importantly, the novice investor, um, trying to decide kind of what to do and how and I'm um, trying to coach them through the process. And pretty much uh, that's kind of my, I think this will be my path. Well, I know it will be just uh, one of my paths for generational wealth, um, making sure I leave that legacy uh, for those that are behind and trying to educate and coach along the way. That's mm -hmm. excellent. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, so, you, you mentioned uh, you're in the reserves. So we talked to a few people in the reserves and, and I always like to find out why the reserves instead of active duty, because uh, I'm just curious, what, what, what uh, was it about the reserves that you, know, that you were like, hey, that's, that's the route? Sure, um, I believe when I came on, I was a young pup. And so I uh, didn't really think about, I was still in high school. So didn't really think about going to active after that. Um, my parents, like you're going to college, that's what you're going to do. Um, so there's no negotiation and interest in how generations change. Um, and so I was like, okay. And I was like, well, I was interested in um, junior ROTC, which was actually Air Force in my high school. Uh, but I wanted to go Army. And uh, he was like, hey, you can do Army, Army Reserve. I was like, I'm still in high school. Um, this actually wasn't a recruiter. This just is another reserve person that was in my high school. And I was like, okay, maybe try it out. And then um, decided to go that route instead of active because I was like, oh, I'll just maybe do ROTC when I get to college or something like that. But never thought of active. And really until somebody presented it to me much later, I think I'd been in the reserves when we came up for probably eight, nine years before someone said, hey, you know, there's another program. I'm like, no, what program is that? And they told me about it and I applied and I waited and, you know, and then it finally got, got selected. And so then I went on to that program. So yeah, it's been good to me. Um, I get to meet uh, my Compo One active duty counterparts. I get to meet National Guard counterparts, um, but I get to work with the reserves every day. Um, and our role keeps changing in this world. So it's kind of nice to see uh, us change from when I started to kind of where we are now. So that's interesting. I'm assuming you're talking about the active guard reserve uh, program. Our reserve program, yes. And you, and then you moved from because I asked that because you said reserves, and then you're like, hey, I just moved from uh, North Carolina to uh, Tennessee, and and I'm and was around Clarksville, I believe. So I sure. figured there had to be something like AGR-ish uh, in there. So yes, uh, definitely, right? Yes, AGR. Um, I my actual office is in Nashville, out of Nashville. Um, I lived outside of Nashville. It's pretty expensive, and so if I want to. Uh, 
talk the talk and walk the walk about staying somewhere where you're going to use your money, uh, Clarksville was the way to go. So I uh, moved out to Carson last year. So. But you get BAH, though, and even AGR, though, correct? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. For Nashville. <laughs> All right, there you go. Yes. Okay, so Absolutely. when was the transition to real estate? So we're in the reserves, and you said you've been serving for eight, nine. Well, you've been serving for about 20, you said 25-ish years? Yes, yeah. About, yes. about 25 yes. years. Uh, so, and, and then we started, you started to buy your first property, your first true investment, you said in 2017-ish. So what, when was that transition made? How was that made? And, and, and what was your, I guess, what sparked that? Sure, good question. Um, well, I think when you get to a point where you're learning about money, uh, learning about finances, um, having certain birthdays helps you to figure that out. Um, and then you go, okay, what's the best way to, way to use my money? Um, I've always um, enjoyed real estate. Um, people would call me about real estate throughout the years when I had no real estate license just because they knew I liked it. Um, and so finally, um, I just like, okay, well, well, maybe that is the way to go. Um, and so that kind of, that was part of my transition. Um, just uh, having been a homeowner early in life and then kind of not, um, you know, you get burnt a little bit. And uh, so I was a landlord before and I was like, oh, no, I don't want to do that again. And I waited for a minute <laughs> before I did that again. Um, just being in a better position, I think, or trying to get yourself in a better position, I think. Um, and then I was like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the plunge. And so I just went back to reading a lot, watching a lot of podcasts. Um, I'm sure we'll get into that. And then, um, and then decided, hey, this is what I think is gonna be the best um, going, probably going forward. Um, um, and yeah, and that was gonna be real estate. But what else can I do outside of the stock market? So. Okay. So it was a way of um, essentially, I guess, diversifying, but you said you liked real estate, right? So what was it that you really liked about real estate? I mean, and I mean, you must've really liked it for, for your friends and family to know like, Hey, call, call Ty. She, you know, she loves this stuff. Let's talk to her about this. Right. So I think um, the good question, I think that really it, what it was about real estate was that um, I'm interested in people and then um, I have a historical background, so my degree is in history. And so geography, right, and um, just geopolitics, like why do people move where they move? Um, you know, what does that look like? And I had begun to move. And so that made me go, hmm, there's different people um, in different places. And that just, uh, just interests me quite a bit. And so, um, and real estate kind of was like that natural um, thing going. So, um, I think my parents kind of helped with that. I didn't realize it too much later in life that, you know, the first house we lived in was, you know, was one that my dad took a lot of pride in fixing and doing things with and just kind of watching that and that progression, you know, to be blessed with that. So I think that had a lot to do with it, but I, I was also just interested in design um, and, uh, and what does that look like? Why would people do those things? It's just, I think a level of curiosity um, and just kind of being around it kind of helped me to be able to say, okay, well, maybe this is something that I, I can do all the time. Um, and there's, it's affectionist too, right? So you start and you like it and you just kind of keep going. And so, yeah, that's kind of where that came from. Okay. Okay. Did you fall into the HGTV trap at all? Cause you're like, Hey, I watch a lot of TV, watch a lot of podcasts, listen to a lot. Of, was it uh cause I know I talked to a lot of people and they're like, Oh, flipping is the way I want to go. Right. It sounds like uh, your first true investment. I'm not sure if it, we'll, we'll get into that here in a second, but it sounded like that was a more buy and hold thing. So w were you ever at any time, like, Oh man, you know, got the HGTV, HGTV bug. I'm going to go flip a house or anything like that. Absolutely. <laughs> um, yes. So the, what it was back in the day, flipping that house and those kinds of things. Uh, uh, definitely watched that. I'm like, I could do that. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, <laughs> we certainly talk about that. Um, never quite did that, but um, yes, definitely HGTV, uh, HGTV. Uh, still watch it now, um, just because there's so many things that now you can pick up on. Um, as it relates to TV and what's, you know, in, in, in real estate, I feel there's, there's still some things you can pick up from it. Um, just not my only source of knowing what's happening in yeah. real estate. 
um, anymore, um, which is probably a good thing for everyone. Um, but yes, I definitely enjoyed it. Um, enjoyed watching it. And then, the, you know, the spinoff, there's always a spinoff to a spinoff. Um, and so, yes, I am guilty of watching HGTV. Real, real estate now. soap opera. <laughs> So let's get into some of the some of the deals. Let's talk about your first deal and uh, why you didn't want to be a landlord. Well, let's just talk about that. Um, how did it happen? Where'd you find it? You know, um, I guess, where were you at as far as uh, your mindset during that time? Right. And then um, how did it eventually put you in a space where you said you decided I don't want to be a landlord anymore? Sure. So it's kind of like where you um, a place where I chose to live. Um, and then it was time to um, move. And, uh, and so that was my first uh, opportunity to be a true landlord. Um, and uh, first, first tenant, uh, so I did everything on my own, self-managed. Um, I tried to find a property manager, um, but that was, uh, <laughs> that was fun. So I'm like, no, I don't have that kind of time. I'll just do it myself. I'll find everybody I need. And I had a very good um, real estate agent. Um, and so we just kind of vetted some folks. And then uh, my first tenant was fine um, until um, she needed to move, uh, you know, six months, seven months into the lease. And, you know, you had that kind of, okay, well, that's great. Um, just pay out, you know, the remainder of what your lease is. And then you can certainly move, you know, no big deal. Um, so that was a little challenge. Um, and so eventually, you know, she uh, had a father who was in real estate, which was interesting. Um, and um, we had eventually negotiated and she moved out. She paid the remainder of her um, lease um, to break the lease. And so that wasn't too bad. Second tenant um, moved in and uh, stayed for a minute, um, but wasn't the best in terms of cleanliness. Um, so, you know, you kind of had a brand new house, sort of. It was probably like two, three years old and new, in my opinion. And uh, and so I learned a lot from that. And uh, it kind of led me to my actual first real investment. Um, and that was, I hadn't went to the property in like two years. Like I knew that what was happening, I had kind of people checking on it. Um, you know, it wasn't really cost country. I just, in the space of time, I didn't. And so when I finally, you know, did put the person out, um, cause it was, you know, non-payment essentially at some point. Um, and I went to my house and I was like, okay, I blame me for everything that's going on. So we went to work and really had to, um, do some sweat equity to get it right. Um, and I thought, mm, after that, so. Uh, I did do it again, um, who actually was ended up to be a very good tenant. And they stayed for a minute. And eventually I came back um, and then uh, cleaned up again, but it wasn't too bad at that point. Learned that you can get a maid service, right? You can pay somebody to go in there and do that. Um, <laughs> um, and, uh, and we did and added some few things. And I, I, I did pretty good um, as far as when it's time to sell. Um, I held on that for a minute. And so, yeah, it was my primary residence. And then, um, and then um, turned that into a rental for a little bit. But my, my first investment, true investment property was 2017. So did you want me to go into that one? No, that, that I mean, that's fine. I think what you describe, we'll, we'll definitely go on that for sure. But I think <laughs> what you described there is what most, what most uh, military families go through when they PCS, right? They, they have a house and usually a lot of times it typically is fairly new, right? It's, you know, it's a newer build, usually a newer community, especially at the, the posts that I've been at, the bases that I've been at, it's usually, you know, families tend to, to go to the newer build um, homes, right? And then <laughs> they go to PCS. And then they have to decide, do I want to self-manage out of state or, or from a distance, or do I want to hire a property manager? And there's pros and cons to both. Um, and it sounds like you've outlined, you've outlined a, a few of each, but if you could talk to someone that is going through that situation, trying to decide, hey, what do I want to do with this? What advice would you give them? I would say it is, you have to know what you can tolerate. And so I, that was huge for me. Like, were you so married to it 
that you still look at it as your home. And if you do, then you probably want property management and you want to be very specific about property management. We could do a whole podcast on property management and time yes. <laughs> uh, because I have uh, gone through some things with property management. Um, there is my expectation and there is the expectation of management. And so you just have to know what your, do you have an in-between um, and what does that look like? And um, are you okay with the 80% solution? Sometimes it's 70, sometimes it's 60. Uh, are you okay with that? And that should help you determine whether you want property management or you want to self-manage. Um, I think there are, like you mentioned, there are pros to both. Um, and then there are cons. So what is your, you know, tolerance there? What, you know, and, and what is your expectation there? Um, and are you still looking at it as a home? And in some cases for us, are we going back to it? Um, and because if you're going back to it, um, then sometimes that helps you to determine whether you're going to do property management or self-management. And I think it's important for people to understand you can transition from either. So let's say you started off at self-managing and like, okay, this is too much, which is what we kind of hear often. And then you go into property management. Um, I've obviously done the opposite where I had property management and I took it back over and self-managed to I found another property management company that worked best for me. So just be okay to know it's okay to switch back and forth. I just don't think there's no absolute when it comes to that. Uh, that's an excellent answer. And, and I love what you, what you said there as far as you can transition, right? Um, it, it doesn't have to be just, just one or the other. And, and there are pros and cons to both. Um, what made you, I, I'm curious, what made you, I'm assuming it's part of the solution. So you said you mentioned 80% solution, 70% solution, 60% solution. It all depends on what you're, what you're comfortable with. And by that, uh, I'm assuming you're talking about what the property manager is going to do, right? Because so you managing the property, you're going to put 100% effort into making sure everything is as perfect as you know, as you want. But everybody else, you know, when you have a property manager, you have someone else, they typically might not perform to 100% of what your ability is or what your expectations are, right? So yes. Um, so what's the what is the one thing that I'm assuming they dip below your expectation level, right? For you to take it back over. What was the main thing that that happened to to make you take it back over, and then until you find another property manager? Oh, uh, I would say um, the main thing for me was communication, um, because I'm that owner. I could live six states away, whatever mileage but it's still my asset. And so I want to communicate about my asset. I'm pretty upfront. Um, I'm straight no chaser, uh, particularly when it comes to my asset. And so I, hey, this is my expectation. And, and I, another point to the property management is you gotta know when to move on. Um, and so, um, so yes, um, the communication wasn't the best. And then the state of the asset, what does, what is it looking like? Um, you know what it was when you turned it over and recognizing that someone living in it is going to be what it is, but, you know, did you really take care of it? Um, you know, and just kind of that part and then just really knowing, um, when to take over, like you mentioned was, is a good thing. I also, know when to move on. I will honestly tell you, I waited too long and it is still costing me. And mm -hmm. so think about that. So if you have that little feeling that something might not be right, that's your intuition, go with it and get some folks to kind of help you out that are outside of property management if you can. Um, and kind of give you a little report back. And that's what I end up doing. And, uh, and then I end up moving on. So yes, uh, if you're not going to be all in self-managing, then know that your management company is not going to be the same in terms of effort every time. Sometimes they will knock it out of the park and they will really do well for a while. Um, and then sometimes they may lag. Um, and just having a little level of grace with property management. And I don't think we think about that too much. 
but just think about what they're getting per house. Um, and so it takes them a minute to get a few for it to be 100% worthwhile as a business. And I think we have to think about that a little bit too, have a little level of grace in that, but still remember it's your asset. You know, it's your business name on it, it's you on it. Um, and you want to keep it for a minute most times, unless you're doing your flipping. Um, then you don't want to keep it very long. <laughs> and that's one of the, uh, the most important things about vetting your property manager, just like you vet anybody else uh, on your team, especially when we're, when we're going to start talking renovations here soon, which um, just, I guess that's a perfect segue to the next, to the next uh, property. Um, let's talk about the, the follow on the first, I guess that's the first true investment. The one you did not live in is the next Correct. one. Okay, so how did that go? And yes. how'd you find it? Who helped you find it? Your team, all that stuff. But well, let's do a little deep dive into that. Yeah, great question. Um, and reading all the items that uh, books and things that I read was okay, get a great realtor. Um, and so um, what they don't tell you is no agent that was, I had a new agent that was willing um, to take on a new investor who didn't really know what she wanted. Um, and so we ended up being a pretty good pair. Um, it took a minute. Uh, I had strict criteria. Um, I had beds, baths, zip codes, and I was not gonna depart from that. Um, just a typical first time anything. First time home buyer is the same way. Uh, same way as an investor. Um, and I had kind of was about to give up. We had seen a lot. Um, I had gone to the why am I here kind of neighborhoods to uh, I don't think I can afford this kind of neighborhoods. Um, so a really quick, really quick description was kind of, of what, what was your criteria? Just just for the for, every, for the listeners uh, out there. Oh, sure. Yeah, my criteria was three bed, two bath, one car garage. Starter home. Um, starter home was not deviating from that. Okay. Um, all the things I had read and like, okay, you have to stay with this. You have to stay with this. Um, and I stuck with that. Um, and so we had seen quite a bit of houses and, you know, when you get to the point where you're like, okay, is, am I going to still stick with this criteria? Am I still going to stick with this agent? This is interesting. And, um, we standing outside of one house and I had begun to look on my own on, on, um, on the website and um, on the app. And I finally said, hey, let's look at this house. Like we're in, the, and I'm, I'm pretty much sure that we're probably not gonna be a team probably much after that. And we go to that house um, that I found and um, it was like, hey, can we, we can see it now. So we drive around and we walk in and I'm like, yep, this is the house. He turns to me, he was like, this is a house. And we just looked at each other like, oh, like he was like, Ty, how did you find this house? And I was like, I just was looking on the, on the app, you know? Um, but it, I had a criteria set and you, of course, you know, everybody has those notifications come through. And I was like, it had just gone on the market um, maybe like a week or beforehand. Um, and we walked in and, and I was like, this is it. Uh, we walked around, um, did what we needed to do. Uh, my agent uh, was Chris. He was very good with construction, so he knew some things and he could teach me some things. And um, no, it was turnkey. Um, and by far, still the best property. I still own that property. It is a military cash flow cow. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, that's it. I know because I'm getting the postcards from the wholesalers. <laughs> so I've been getting that for a while now. So, uh, yeah, so that was it. It was, um, it was three, two, one car garage in the zip code I wanted, which is the best school district in the area. Uh, one of the best. Um, and you know, I think the only thing about that is that i purchased it, we closed in September. And so no one really tells you about that when it's time to get your tenant. Uh, I don't know how, how many are looking in September, October, you know, that kind of. So it's important to know that we, we, we have, you have all your other checks, just realize when you're buying and when it's settled and done, you get those keys and you need to have that tenant in. Um, so 
I'm really trying to do better about the rotation of my tenants, that it's a good time period to get another tenant. Um, so I was blessed to be able to get one like in December, but just imagine you close in September and you know, you might have not included that in your numbers uh, for a turnkey property in yeah. September. So yeah, so that was my first uh, investment property. Took a minute to find, honestly. Okay. All right. So you got your first, uh, well, you got your first true investment. Was there, I know you said it was turnkey, but it wasn't like you literally didn't do anything, no paint, no anything at all. You just, okay. Man, that's, that's phenomenal. So, I mean, yes, I think I, I felt bad. So I had somebody go in there and clean it, you know, just because like, okay, <laughs> this can't be this true for this price. Let's have somebody go in and clean it. Like, so right you before the tenant came. You mentioned one thing that uh, I think some of our listeners might not have really caught, but you said, I know it was a good deal because the wholesalers started calling. What does that mean? What do you, what do you mean when you say that? Oh, all right, good. Yes. Uh, question. Um, well, what I mean by that is that uh, the wholesale community, um, those that go out, find properties and, you know, um, provide value in that way. Um, they have begun to, I become that person that they want to buy from uh, because they see, number one, I'm a out of town investor. Uh, so they can purchase or somehow get a list uh, for those individuals in that particular area if they've chosen your area. Um, they also can get high equity. Um, and so I suspect they see that in my property is also in the best school district. So if they have created a database um, to find people within a certain zip code in a certain area um, with, you know, these other parameters, um, they're probably looking at, at, they're probably looking at my house um, and any other ones that might have been purchased during that time. I think to uh, myself and another, um, and another purchaser purchased around the same time. Um, and so um, I'm kind of hot on their list. Um, I went from the postcards, um, they've kind of followed me a little bit to the text messages, which is the new thing. Yeah. Um, if you have your phone number that you probably shouldn't have out there, out there. Um, so, so that, yes, so that's it uh, with the wholesalers. Um, yep. I think they feel like I got a good deal and they kind of want in on and see do I want to. You know, see, you equity. You pro you're probably on someone's equity list right now. Cause I'm sure I'm assuming based definitely. off everything you're saying, you have, you know, at least 25, 30% equity in the home. Um, so definitely. Mm -hmm. yeah, so <laughs> that's, that's the big indicator. And then on top of that being out of state, that's like chick ching. That's a wholesaler's like a uh, dream right there. So dream call. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So got that first turnkey, got that under your belt. Uh, you got the tenant in, it was a tricky time, but I, I like that you mentioned that point um, because I'm assuming you were, were you also in the military town? Uh, for, was that one also in the military town, like around Bragg area? So yes, that's, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So like, like Ty mentioned, if you are investing around military areas and you're doing the buy and hold, um, as you guys know, hey, there's PCS cycles. People don't typically PCS at random times in like <laughs> in September or like, you know, um, October and things. Typically it's around, you know, anywhere between December and January and then the summertime. You got your summer movers and your winter movers pretty much. So um, that's definitely one, um, one very good uh, consideration that you should be, you know, factoring in um, when you, when you go to flip these homes as far as your, your time schedule and things like that. So that's, that's key. So the next property, right? So that's your, so that was your first uh, rental. Uh, you got the bug from there. You started making a little cash flow. Um, what did yes. the next one look like? How long was the wait period? And um, what the, actually, what did that first rental, that first true rental do for you as far as, you know, your mindset, as far as, I don't know, catching the bug, just did that do anything for you? Absolutely. Um, catching the bug. The first one is the hardest. And then you don't know how to stop. Uh, <laughs> if you keep your... Um, if you keep uh, your, in, you know, your criteria, but you become flexible on this criteria, um, 
your numbers are your numbers. And so as long as you're maintaining those numbers, I think it's fine. Um, but the idea of getting the tenant a little later than I have thought in terms of my numbers uh, shifted when I was able to go again, right? And so I um, had to wait, make sure like, okay, is this stable? Um, and everything is good. And then once I was able to say, okay, yes, I'm, uh, it's uh, been a couple months. I continue to watch the market. I continue to, um, as they say, analyze deals and just really try to understand. I thought I really knew, um, but there were some other factors that I didn't include in that first one that I definitely did in the second one. Um, and then I expanded my search outside of uh, a couple of zip codes um, and expanded my search. And um, I actually went up in purchase price um, a bit as well um, because of this particular uh, area. And so not necessarily attached uh, to the Fort Brad, North Carolina area, but certainly an area people like to live in. So understanding your market was huge um, for me because I thought I understood it, but I didn't understand it as an investor. And that's the key. You have to understand it as an investor, not just because that's where you live or lived. Um, and so once I did that, I was like, okay, this is kind of the next place I want to kind of invest. And so I would say probably five months, probably six months later, um, I began looking again, um, different agent, um, and uh, who ends up really helping me to understand kind of the investment part. Um, but uh, someone, an agent who understood investing, but he was also a property manager. So again, key, um, changed up my agent, had a different kind of expertise, which then helped me when it was time for me to get that next property. So then I went three, one and a half, because the difference was like $25. Um, and it didn't have a, like, three bedrooms, one and a half bath, no garage, carport, you know, and uh, didn't make that much of a difference on my cash flow. And so I went for it. Um, and then you kind of learn uh, different agents, kind of what that looks like. Um, and then also um, just your expectation. So uh, that second one was also turnkey. Um, and uh, it was obviously a little bit more, it was in a different neighborhood. So I could kind of understand why, uh, but literally turnkey, I didn't do anything. Uh, I got it cleaned, uh, and because it was a popular area, I had a tenant before I had actually closed. So, okay, if, if, if she closes, I want it kind of thing. And um, yeah, had that tenant up until about a month ago. So That's awesome. That's awesome. So um, it seems like you're starting to narrow down your strategy, and you, you, you've, um, it seems like even from the beginning, you already had a, a strategy. So there's a lot of different strategies. There's, you know, the live and flip, there's the, you know, I guess just a regular flip, there's a buy and hold, you got wholesale, you got, you got a bunch of different facets of, of real estate just in the residential um, sector alone, right? So what made you choose that strategy? Because it it, I'm seeing a trend here, hey, buy and hold, don't really got nothing, it's turnkey, you know, <laughs> you're starting to upgrade a little bit in the area, you know, you're, you're getting where the, where the better school districts are, maybe, you know, mid range, mid price ranges, you know, uh, sure. where people really, really want to live at. So what helped you, what helped you define your strategy and what helped you find your strategy? I would say, um, definitely reading, um, and getting that, you know, um, getting that, kind of down pat and say, okay, let me really understand um, what it is um, that, I'm, that I'm dealing with. Um, that cash flow helps. Uh, so if you buy right and, and, and do those things right, those numbers don't lie. You want them to lie, they don't, they don't lie. It, it is what it is. Um, and, um, and I think that I, I was thinking about the, um, a different strategy. Uh, so in between that time, let me find that, um, that buy and hold, I did venture out a little bit. So, oh, maybe I'll try a VA or a HUD home and, and maybe I'll do that. And, um, and I think I put a bid out on one and got, oh, cause I didn't know what I was doing. And of course I got overbid. 
Um, and then I, I did that twice in between that time. And I was like, mm, this is not going to work. Um, and I really knew that if I didn't keep going, I might have a squirrel moment and go to something else. And so like, if I want to keep this going, then I probably need to stick with essentially answering your question. What do I know? I know buying a house, putting an attendant in, making sure the numbers work, having property management, good, bad, or indifferent, or self-managing, that's what I know. And so I'm gonna stick with what I know until I get to a position where I can venture out and be okay with a loss. I think we have to be okay with the L sometimes because um, we all wanna win um, because we're a winning culture, but um, I wasn't ready just yet. So um, dabbled in that other part, put a couple bids out, thought, well, okay, this isn't me. Um, let me stick with what I know. Let me relax a little bit on this criteria um, because if I do, I probably could find more and I could probably find more quicker. Um, and then um, it's about that set at the end of that second one that I came up with kind of what I wanted to do. And that was, you know, buy and hold up at that time, you know, purchase two properties per year until I retire. Um, that was the original goal. That goal has gone away. Um, that was because uh, you can buy two properties very quickly um, <laughs> if you know what you're doing. And so um, I've departed from that just a little bit. Um, but yeah, so buying holes what I knew. I was very interested in the other categories. Um, tried my hand at it. Um, I mean, I always went to, okay, this is what you need to bid. This is also what you need for um, rehab. We, got, we had done the whole nine with the rehab um, costs and what that would be. Um, and at the end of the day, I just decided that let me just go with what I know. Um, and that, and that ended up being buy and hold. It was turnkey, um, and each one of mine has been turnkey, actually. So I've not done anything <laughs> hey, I love um, it. with any of them. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love um, anyone listening out there a lot. Oftentimes, just like Ty mentioned, we, we do get a squirrel mentality. You see other people doing things that sound interesting. They might be getting a little extra money in, you know, in some, in some uh, part right? But um, it's a lot of times it's better. Like, so they say the riches are in the niches, right? Basically like stick to Absolutely. one strategy, stick to one thing, uh, perfect that. And then once you, once you actually have a very good grasp of that, then you start venturing out a little bit more, which uh, I think, I think is phenomenal advice. I, I like that you, uh, that you said that. And um, the other thing you said, you said uh, your original plan was to get two uh, two houses a year, right? And then you said that went out the window. I'm assuming that increased, uh, or, or you know, increased a lot. Um, maybe due in part to the 10x, the 10x uh, growth con. Maybe I don't know. You started 10x in your goals or something. Absolutely, uh, 10x changed me. Ask anybody that knows me after 10x or before, um, and, in a good way. Uh, just thinking too small. I think probably is where I went with that. Um, and we want to be careful. And what I found is, is that anything you do and invest in is gonna be risky. There is a level of risk. Um, and if it wasn't that way, then everybody would be doing it, right? And so, um, so I, I think that's important. And yeah, so yes, definitely the 10X and then just, just thinking too small and actually asking yourself what what is your goal? Uh, what are you trying to accomplish? What is your why? Um, those types of things matter. And that will shift your goals. Um, but you got to know that sometimes you have goals before you know your why. And then you kind of kind of shift that around. And so uh, that's kind of where kind of where we are with that. So yeah, I mean, sh shifting me to start my own company, uh, you know, those kinds of things, get a license, uh, a real estate license, because um, I was kind of thinking too small. Um, and then you don't want to be behind your uh, side yourself, you want to remain humble um, and grateful and have a level of gratitude. And I feel like you can do that and still think big. So. <laughs> still think that the, the whole 10X <laughs> conference. I, I think um, 
I love that, right? So basically, you know, growth comes through pushing yourself, right? And, and that's in any aspect. If you want to build muscles, right, you got to get in the gym and you got to, you, you know, tear your muscles and then they regrow. That's how, you know, the growth Definitely. comes from. That's how you build those muscles. Same thing with your mind. Same thing with your brain. Same thing with the activities that you do on a day-to-day basis, right? Um, Ty's saying, hey, you know, at first, I, you know, I was thinking small, you know, and then, and now I'm, I'm thinking differently. I started educating myself, started going out networking, going to different conferences, and, and that's changed me. That's, um, that's helped spark growth, right? And now yes. you're, you're, you're operating at different levels, which I think is fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah. And you attract who you are, but you also attract what you will be, you know? Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you have people who knew you, two years ago, I'm like, okay, and I know you now, that's one thing, but, you know, I, I'm just as, you know, just as interested in who I'm going to meet, um, and I don't think I was ever that way, it's like, okay, you know, um, but now, who am I going to meet, um, and uh, what is their story, and, you know, those types of things kind of interest me more so than anything else, and I think that it's always been there, going back to our original conversation about how did you deal with how'd you get into real estate, you know, to begin with, uh, has everything to do with it. Um, and then I had a really good agent, um, who just really taught me the process and made it not seem so fearful. Um, and then I just was able to turn that in obviously years later into something a little bit different, but yeah. Just dropping bombs. I I love it. So if you had to, um, if you had to give one piece of advice to any, actually, before I ask that question, um, how has the military, right? How has the military helped you in your real estate investing ventures? Well, the military has helped me because I know what my paycheck is going to be. And ah, that's not going to change. And like so, that. right. And so I know what I'm getting. America knows what I'm getting. Right. And so that's not going to change. So anything else I do to add to that, that's on me. Right. And so that's, what I've charged to do. And so the military has helped me to know what I'm getting and what more or what less I can do, you know, what I can do with, what I can do without. Um, And then also it has helped me with a level of mindset and leadership. And I think leadership is leading yourself. I think we're so quick to put leadership as that definition of influencing others, and that is true, but you also have to influence yourself um, as well in, in, in order to be able to do that. And so that's what the military has done for me. Um, let me know, this is what you're getting. You're not getting any more, any less. Um, what you do outside of that is on you. Um, and then you need to be that person to, you know, to make that time to do anything else. Um, but leadership is, uh, you lead you first, and then you can influence and lead others. And lead others and then um, definitely the network you have a I have a sense of family that um, I have a very strong family network you know shout out to my mom sisters dad all those folks that are it's definitely been a village helped me along this way uh, but the military has given me a different kind of family that um, I've been in for almost 30 years 20 something years something like that so yeah that's what it's done for me Excellent. 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 I I like to find out that question because a lot of people think that they're that real estate or just any kind of entrepreneurial venture um, doesn't relate or you can't take things away from or you can't take some of your service, some of the things you learn while serving. um, You can't take that away and apply that to anything entrepreneurial wise. So uh, which I I think is is not the case. And I think you've highlighted that point, especially um, talking about the leadership piece. Right. Um, it's not it's not just about influencing others. Yes, that's very important. However, influencing yourself and leading yourself um, is even more important because that's going to dictate how far you uh, come in life and actually how far how how far you're able to influence others to do things. So um, I think that's extremely important. Absolutely. So, and the expectation for you, who, those who have served, is a much different expectation. It will be like that till the end of your time. Um, you serve, so the expectation is that you have other things in you that others don't, right? Because we're part of the 1%. So let's just know that <laughs> and, uh, and use that to your advantage um, to add value and, and help others. So, 
Love it. Love it. So there's one piece of advice that you can give to other service members out there or anybody that's listening that wants to get on your plan and wants to get on your path. What would that advice be? One piece. Um, I think I kind of summed it up is learn and act. And so you have to learn books, podcasts, whatever, act. But the best advice I can give you is to pick a date that you are going to purchase and go all in on that date. Mm. I did that. I picked a date. I said, it's going to happen. I was ultra focused on that date. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that I meet that date. Um, it's okay to do it early. It's okay to do a little bit late, but pick a date. Otherwise, you keep sliding that scale um, and you're never going to actually start. So start, pick a date, and then and just keep with that. So that's the advice I give. Nice. Pick a date. I haven't heard that one. I know it's kind of part of your, I guess, smart goals, you know, like um, specific, measurable. Um, one in there, I think it's time, I believe, but <laughs> I don't know off the yes. top of my head. But, but yeah, that's, uh, that's key, definitely. It kind of stops you from procrastinating, right? So. Yes, and paralysis analysis and all those other things that are there to be nothing but distractions to you for your goal. Pick your date, stick with it, let everybody know I'm working towards this. Um, and those that are part of your village, they'll understand um, and just be ultra focused and you'll do it. And, um, and you'll be glad you did, you know? Excellent. Hey, excellent advice. How can our listeners get in contact with you? Or um, on uh, IG, I am Ty's World, um, T-Y-S-W-O-R-L-D-E. Um, on Facebook, I have Ty Mangum, so Ty Realtor on Facebook, my business uh, business page. Um, sure, you can email me, Ty Does Real Estate at gmail.com. And also, um, you can reach me on LinkedIn as well. Ty Mangum on um, LinkedIn as well. So that's how you can reach me. Reach out. Um, Excellent. Get started. If you haven't gotten started, if you're in it, keep going. That's what I say. Excellent. 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 Hey, you guys, make sure you reach out to Ty. She has a wealth of information, obviously, as you've heard, especially when it comes to the turnkey investment. She has some kind of magical power to find those things, even when, we're, even when realtors can't, right? So, and now she is a realtor. And now she is a realtor. So it's even- I am a realtor. Right? Yes. So now she can yes, put the powers to work for you. <laughs> Absolutely. Help you along your way. I want to coach you on your journey. Just, uh, just know it's a journey. That's all. Excellent. Excellent. And uh, all of her contact information will be in the show notes. So make sure you uh, check those out. Um, have everything down there. Hey, if you are, um, if you are listening to this on podcast, really appreciate uh, leaving us a five-star review, uh, leave us a comment, or you got anybody else that you think that we should interview or should, should hear about, uh, definitely go ahead and leave that comment. We read those and we do take action on those. Uh, same thing with YouTube. You got any comments, you got any questions? I'm sure Ty will be there and she'll be able to answer those questions on our YouTube channel as well. Um, if you have any questions about anything that has been talked about on this episode, um, also, make sure you subscribe if you haven't. You got you to gotta subscribe, guys. Um, and then we got a Facebook group. We got about 1,500 members or so on there right now. So it's growing day by day. And we have phenomenal people on there like Ty, who's in the, uh, who's in the Facebook group answering questions and helping other service members out build, building wealth uh, through, through real estate, right? So um, other than that, I mean, that's all I got. Um, again, Ty, thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate that. Thanks for having me. I really had a great time and uh, I wish everybody well um, in their real estate investing journey. Let's get at it. Let's get at it. And with that said, this is Dan Wynn signing off. <laughs>